Good evening. I can tell they got that mic fixed tonight. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, it is good to see everybody that's here. Tonight is the beginning of our summer series. We have Brother John DeBerry with us here this evening, so we're glad to that you could come here. Whether you're listening online uh, through Facebook or you're seeing this later on YouTube or Ben Loman, we're pleased that you've taken the time. If you're here with us tonight visiting, we want you to know that we're glad that you've came. We hope you see that Bobby Branch does things according to the way the New Testament teaches us to do things. We meet on Sunday at 9 o'clock, and then we have Bible study following that at 1015, and then we meet again Wednesday night for Bible study at uh, 7 o'clock. If you'd like to take out your Bible tonight and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. That will be our scripture reading this evening. Um, the screen is still down, so we will be um, using our books this evening. Number 234, if you'd like to go ahead and get your songbook out, number 234. That's Brother Joel's first song for this evening. Going over some uh, area events that's going on today, Grange Hall has a gospel meeting starting going through Wednesday. Um, it's with Brother Chris Whitaker. Ivy Bluss VBS starts today going through the Wednesday. This Friday and Saturday, the Diana singing will be going, taking place. And starting next Sunday, Morrison has a VBS through Wednesday. New Hope has VBS through Wednesday. And Rockcliffe is going to be having a, a gospel meeting with Ernst Benjamin. Our youth news, we have um, high school students. Uh, Jason's going to start Sunday night eats up. So if you'd like to do that, see him after services for that. Uh, this uh, Saturday evening is TBH. It starts Saturday evening, 5 to 9, and then Sunday morning from 9 to 11. That's with uh, Brother Lonnie Jones. That's at the Morrison Congregation. Please sign up today for that. Um, June the 18th, pizza and painting. Um, June 22nd, birthday Wednesday. June the 25th is kayaking. Please sign up by this Wednesday. Um, if you need equipment, by next Wednesday, if you just plan on coming so they can have arrangements for everybody, June the 26th is a Home Devo. Visitation Group 1, don't forget your meeting tonight following services. Also announced this morning, congratulations to the, to the bars. Uh, Hannah Maynard, which is Kurt and Stephanie's daughter, married Cooper Barr in Kentucky this past Tuesday. They will be residing in Bowling Green. Our sick list we have, we have a few to mention, I'll, and I have had a few more to list, so I'm going to go over them real quick. Margaret Schillinger, these, these are all at home. Margaret Schillinger, David Cathy, W.C. and Nelma Chilton, Dennis and Janice Foster, Teresa Gann, Morris Griffith, Alan Owens, Tony Giannis. Also, it was in our bulletin, Jimmy Ramsey, which is Maggie Hurst's brother-in-law, completed his chemotherapy. And Don Sullivan uh, is going to be staying at home for a little while. Um, so please keep all of them in your prayers. Also sick, I didn't mention, of course I mentioned he wasn't here, but Brother Tony was sick this morning. Sister Amy Lawrence is sick. Uh, Sister Doris Smith is homesick as well. And also Ken and Nona Martin are homesick also. So let's keep all of them in our prayers. Uh, at the hospital, we have Kathy Hennessy and Standiford. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way. Oh, uh -huh. 
number 924. so thankful that we have these opportunities such as this to come together and worship you. Father, we pray that these abilities would be able to be had all throughout time as long as time is on the face of the earth. Father, we're thankful for Jesus who came here and lived that perfect life, lived that good example for us to strive to live by, and Father made that plan of salvation possible for us to go to heaven. Pray, Father, that we would live our lives in according to your will and that we would have that home in heaven after this life. We're mindful, Father, of those that are sick and not able to be with us. Pray, Father, that they would regain their health, if it be thy will, be able to back with, be back with us soon. We're also mindful of those who've lost loved ones. Pray, Father, that they would look to you for guidance and strength and comfort in these hard days. Father, we pray that those that are around the world are spreading your word, that they would do so in truth and spirit, and that the word would fall on good and honest hearts, and many souls would be saved and brought to you. Pray, Father, that you be with the speaker tonight. I pray that we would listen attentively. I pray that we would apply those things from your word to help us to be better Christians in the future. I pray that you would please forgive us of our sins. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. As the invitation is extended this evening, we'll sing 655, 655, and before, the, before the scripture reading and the lesson number 839. What a song of delight in a city so bright will be one in the people.
scripture reading this evening is taken from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out the, and set in order many proverbs. Well, good evening. We have, do have a good crowd with us this evening. We're glad that you did jo choose to join us this evening. Uh, we start this evening with our summer series. Each Sunday night through June and July, we'll have different speakers with us. And our topic this year is Ecclesiastes, a man's search for meaning. And so tonight, we have Brother John D. Berry with us, and he'll be uh, uh, speaking to us on the uh, topic of the pondering of the preacher. So I want to, uh, Brother D. Berry probably doesn't need much introduce, introduction. He's spoken for us here several times. He's spoken at other area congregations, but I will if you'll bear with me. Uh, Brother D. Berry is the preacher today for the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ in Memphis. He was educated at Freed Harbor University and the University of Memphis, and he served 26 years in the Tennessee House of Representatives. And he's currently a senior advisor to Governor Bill Lee. He also serves on the Board of Trustees for Freed Hardman University. So at this time, Brother D. Berry, if you would, come preach for us. I love that song we just sang, When All of God's Children Get Home. And I like it because it reminds us of something that we often forget in the times in which we live, in the place in which we live, and because of the many, many, many blessings that God has given us. We sometimes forget that this is not home, that we are here, we are pilgrims and sojourners, we are a colony of heaven. Paul said to the brethren at Philippi, and he alluded to it over and over within the Pauline epistles, that this is not home, that our citizenship or our conversation is in heaven. In essence, the apostle Paul is saying something that Jesus reminded them of and reminded the disciples of before his ascension. After he had given Peter a terrible prediction that was a gut punch for the tough apostles. He said, you're going to deny me three times. Before the rooster crow, <clears throat> you're going to deny me three times. Peter couldn't believe this, and I can imagine when I think about this good man's personality and how he prided himself on being strong and pronouncing to the Lord several times, I'll die for you. I will die for you. And the Lord says, no, no, Peter, <clears throat> before <coughs> morning, you're going, to <coughs> you're going to deny me at least three times. But then the Lord said something to Peter that gives all of us pause and also gives us cause to be optimistic about our own lives, even in the face of failure, disappointment, when we even break God's heart by violating his justice and his love. He says in John chapter 14 in verses 1, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, Peter, you, you are a man of faith. You believe in the Father. Give me the same belief. Give me the same trust that you give the Father. And he says, you believe in the Father. He says, believe also in me, in my Father's house, in this place that you need to come and want to come and deserve to come if you obey me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That gives every one of us as Christians a understanding of who we are, whose we are, 
and where we are <clears throat> at this particular time, that God wants us to know, don't get too attached to those things that are here because you are not at home. And one day, God wants all of his children to come home. One of the most beautiful verses in the scriptures that all of us quote, that all of us know, but very few times do we really understand the profundity of the statement. When we're told, when James tells us, Peter tells us, Paul tells us, God is not willing, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life. God says, you're my children. This is not your home. Destruction and uh, being distracted by my enemy and your adversary is not what I want for you. God has all power, and God can make heaven big enough for everybody who wants to come. And therefore, I understand that's where my citizenship is. I'm just part of a colony on this earth of heaven, and one of these days, I want to go home. You can't stay. We can't stay. It doesn't matter how much we want to stay. It doesn't matter what we accumulate, what we hoard, what we place away, what we bank, what we hide. You can't stay. At some point in time, it is appointed. It is an appointment, and we're going to keep that appointment, and we all will leave this world. We thank God so much for this day and for each and every one of you. And I thank the brethren, the fine ministers and elders and deacons and members of this congregation and those in this area for inviting me to be part of this great lectureship series. And I pray that I say something that is value added <clears throat> that will strengthen you in the most holy faith as you study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Would you pray briefly with me? Merciful God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. As we stand before your people, the greatest people on earth, it's our prayer that you are glorified and we're edified by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When we study the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a very interesting book. And it's part of a collection of books that is often called wisdom literature. Because of those things that are written therein, as the Holy Spirit has inspired, as God has dictated, for us to understand what his will, his word, and his way is. This is something that all of us have to get from God, because man, even though God made us a living soul <clears throat> and gave us reason, and intelligence, we still need inspiration. <clears throat> Man still needs a word from God. Jeremiah and Isaiah and all the prophets have said this over and over about God and what we need uh, from God. Jeremiah said one time, he says, O oh Lord, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 and verses 25, he said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh, that travels, that lives in this realm, on this earth. It is not in man that walketh, that's seeking to please you, that's seeking to make a living, that's seeking to build his family in a relationship. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah basically says that without revelation, and without direction, man cannot direct his steps without help from God. There are certain things that man innately are not going to understand. We might see the stars and the sun and the moon, and man is often called the upward-looking one because there's something in us that tells us there's got to be someone greater than we are. You can find folks who are as far back in the jungles and the sticks and behind mountains and volcanoes, and they've never seen or heard of a Bible, but they're going to worship something. They may worship the power of the lions and tigers. They may worship the majesty of the volcano. They may worship the sun or the moon or the river or a crocodile, but they're going to worship something because he's the upward-looking one. Something in us tells us that we need to worship. Unfortunately, 
In our day and time, with the advent of secular humanism, materialism, and worldliness, and, and all of the various doctrines and commandments of men, men have turned that worship toward himself, and he worships himself, and he is more impressed with himself often than he is of God. That's unfortunate because it changes the dynamics to where I'm looking for someone to tell me what is right, tell me how to live, tell me what to do, tell me what is true, tell me what is accurate, tell me where I came from. The only reason we know where we came from is because God told us. When God had Moses write in retrospect the Pentateuch, and he told him to write, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Within that statement, God is sending a message to man who he made with intellect and reason and intelligence. I made you. I personally don't go to the zoo to visit relatives. I understand that I was created, formed from the dust of the earth, and God breathed into my nostrils the breath of life. I became a living soul. How do I know my origin? Because God told me my origin. Then my intelligence, my common sense, my reasoning, my intuitiveness tells me that creation demands a creator. That life demands a life giver. That if there is order, there must be an authority behind the order. In essence, something tells me that there must be a God. So when we look at wisdom literature, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, the book of Psalm of Solomon, these books that are called wisdom literature basically teaches us about life and how to live the simple things of decision making because life ultimately is about decisions that we make and the consequences of those decisions that we make. Ultimately, that's what life is about. Because, as I said to the folks at Coleman when I preached this morning there in Memphis, that we must understand all we own is our record. I don't own this plant, this tent, this body. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs and returns to where God will send it, who created it in the first place. The body returns to the dust from which it came. I don't own the animating spirit that made Adam open his eyes and his lung began to billow and his heart began to beat. I don't own that spirit. It returns to God who gave it. The only thing I own is my soul, my record, that record of things, the thoughts and, and attributes and attitudes and characteristics and character, if you please, that I exemplified during the course of my life. When the Lord judges me and when he calls me from labor to reward, when he comes, when he left, he was my savior, but when he returns, he's my judge. He's not going to look at what I'm wearing and where I went to school and the prefixes and suffixes on my name. He's going to look within my heart. He's going to look at my thoughts and my actions. And wisdom literature basically tells us in a common sense way, all of those books, especially the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, are written in comparative language. In essence, God says, I give you wisdom. I give you intelligence. God, when he made the animals, he gave them instinctive motivation. They have to act within their nature. The cow moves because that's his nature. The dog barks because that's his nature. They can't one day say, well, you know what? I think I'm going to learn dog and learn another language. The dog can't say, well, yeah, I think I'll learn cow language. They can't do that because they have to act within their nature because they were given instinctive motivation. God gave us intelligence. God gave us reasoning. And then God gave us law that we can make a decision. So when we look at those books, 
They are written in comparative language. God gives you the blessings. God gives you the curses. God gives you the positives. He gives you the negatives. He tells you those things that build you up. He instructs you on those things that would tear you down and destroy you. Those things that give you vision and discerning and understanding and those things that blind you with ignorance and perversion. God writes those books in comparative language and much of the parabolic teaching of Jesus Christ is also in comparative language where he compares the blessing with the curse, the good with the bad. What is God trying to do? I told you earlier, God doesn't want to have to tell anybody to get out of my face. He really doesn't. God's not one of those movie gods sitting on the throne with a bolt of lightning in his hand to strike us down just to prove what a big shot he is. That's not our God. Our God is a God of love, a God who wants us to be saved. Therefore, in the golden text of the Bible, in John chapter 3, when Jesus gave his mission his message, and his methodology all wrapped up in that beautiful verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word so in that context is an adverb of degree. How much did God love us? He so loved us that Jesus became incarnate. Jesus put on the flesh. Jesus became a man so that he could pay our sin debt. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, regardless of color or kind or culture or ethnicity or geography, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then to top it off, Jesus made it extremely clear. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. God loves us enough that he don't want his enemy and our adversary to have control of your soul. Have you ever thought about that attribute of God, that God hates to lose? God says, I'm a jealous God. He's a jealous God. God doesn't want the soul of his creation, his family, his children, to be in a place he didn't even create for us. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He didn't create it for you. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He prepared hell for the devil and his angels. And the only way you can even get there is to accept the invitation of the current occupant. So when I look at God, I see a God who is trying to give me wisdom, the tools, so I can make good decisions so that he can look at me one day and say, well done. He's not saying I was perfect. He's not saying I was sinless. He's not saying that I never made mistakes, never misspoke. He's not saying that there weren't times he thought I was crazy, but he say, well done mean when I messed up, I ran back to you and said, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, I need thee. I need thee every hour I need thee. In essence, my weakness depends on his strength. My ignorance depends on his infinite knowledge. My my uh, failures depend on his success. As Jesus one time said, I have overcome the world. Everything that makes you fail, I have overcome the world. John tells us what the world tries to do to us. So when we go to wisdom language, wisdom literature, basically it's sort of like my dad used to say to me when I was a boy, and there were three of us, all three boys preached today. My brother Ed was in the pulpit in Charlotte. My brother Tony was in the pulpit at South Germantown in Memphis. I was in the pulpit at, at uh, Coleman Avenue in Memphis. My sister's husband was in the pulpit at Horn Lake and Levi. This didn't happen by accident. This happened because we were raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because we had somebody that would grab us by the scruff of our neck 
and tell us exactly who we were going to be, how we were going to act, and it really wasn't debatable in my father's house. It wasn't up for the discussion. I don't ever remember being asked if I felt like going to school or if I wanted to go to church or if I wouldn't mind doing the things I've been ordered to do as my chores. I, I just don't remember any of that. But the fact is, God wants us to understand something, that there are those who are trying to change and alter you. John said, love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why, John? Because all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. So when you got everything the world has to offer, you still haven't profited anything. This is why Jesus asked all of us that pointed question, what does it profit? What does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange? What's, what's the price of your sellout? What's the price of you selling your soul for a few days on this earth of the pleasures that this earth has to offer? So when we go back to wisdom literature, it reminds me of something, I, as I was mentioning me and my brothers, not to brag, but I was mentioning my dad used to say something. He says, I'm going to teach y'all. And he would make us study Proverbs. He would make us study the preacher, the teacher in Ecclesiastes. He would go through the various individuals within the scripture. I sat and listened to him preach all my childhood. He preached almost 60 years. And he says that these books are written to help you not be stupid. And, and that's what he told us all the time. He said, these books are written to help you not be stupid. And, and he would give the examples how not to be stupid in your life, stupid with women, stupid with money, stupid with your trust and who you trust, stupid with the things you desire. I can remember him going through the book of Proverbs and saying, this is what the teacher, the preacher is trying to do. He's trying to keep his boys, to keep those who read, understand that wisdom is the subject of the discussion, how not to be stupid. And don't you understand that you have an adversary that wants you to make stupid decisions? We have an adversary that wants us not to think, not to be wise, not to weigh the blessings and curses, not to look at the advantages and disadvantages, the right and the wrong. You have an adversary that wants you to be stupid. That's why Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. He could have just said, don't be stupid. Be sober, be vigilant. Why, Peter? Your adversary, he calls him by name the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. That, that lion depends on that prey, making one stupid mistake, and, and in doing so, that's how he's going to get his dinner. God usually gave those lambs and those wildebeests and all of those little skipping, jumping, running beasts, he gave them all type of agility and all type of speed. The lion can have a burst of speed, but he gets tired real quick because he's so massive. He's so heavy. So he can have a burst of speed about 40 miles an hour, but he runs out of gas real fast. While that little deer, that wildebeest, can hop around and skip around and jump and drop over logs and trees forever until he runs away. But the lion is depend, depending on that prey, not paying attention. He's depending on him to get involved and enamored in what he's doing, what he's eating, and how good it tastes, the nice breeze that's here in the African jungle or Indian jungle. He's depending on that prey to get stupid. Stop watching, stop paying attention, and stop realizing that you're being stalked by somebody that wants you for dinner. And by the time, as Peter said, a roaring lion who walked about seeking whom he may devour, by the time that lion roars, 
And that millisecond that that animal stops to see, his big paw is already turning his hind side around. He's flipping him, and he grabs him by the throat and drags him away. And his version of a hot meal is disemboweling that animal while he looks him in the eye and eats him alive. That's why Peter used that, that terminology, that methodology, that metaphor. That's why he used it. Because he wants us to understand that we're being stalked. And you can't be stupid. You've got to be visual. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to discern. You've got to think. You've got to act in your own best interest. You don't trust everybody. You don't listen to everything. When you read the book of Ecclesiastes over and over and over, the preacher is saying, act in your own best interest. Be smart. Be vigilant. Don't be stupid, as my daddy used to tell us. I, you know, as a boy, you know, you felt like your dad was being insulting. You know, we're a lot smarter than you think you, we are, Daddy. We, we, you know, I remember we went to the Mid-South Fair there in Memphis one time, and you may have heard this story before, if so, just pardon the redundancy. And, I, and we went, and I had worked, man. I had bailed hay. I had driven a John Deere from can to can't. I had done a little bit of everything to have a pocket full of money. Had a brand new little hat cocked to the side. Had a brand new sweater, brand new pair of jeans, brand new pair of Converse. Man, I was sharp as a tack. And I'm walking in the fair with a pocket full of money. Me and my friend, we both preached our same, our first sermon on the same day. Guy saw us coming in and said, hey, guys, come over here. He realized he was looking at a couple of country boys. I had moved from Memphis, the big city, thank God, and finished growing up in the country. And he looked at us and he summed us up like that lion sums up that little wildebeest. He said, come over here, fellas, come over here. We walked over there. He showed us a transistor radio. Remember them? He set that transistor radio there. He showed me a watch, what was it, Weldon, Timex, somebody, with a, one of those flex, flex bands on it. He set it right there. Oh, man, he laid out all that stuff and said, all you got to do is put down a dollar. Put down a dollar and you can take all of this home. We're standing there like a couple of idiots, stupid. We put down the dollar. One dollar turned to two. Two turned to three, three turned to five, five turned to 10, 10 turned to 20, 20 turned to 30. Before I walked my stupid self away from there, he had my whole $50. My daddy went to his grave never knowing what I did that day at the fair. <laughs> I never told him just how I had stood there and let that man make a total idiot out of me me and my buddy Bo, he had all our money, and we walked away with one of those little stupid things that you put on your fingers and you can't get your fingers. That's what I had to show for my $50. Well, don't you realize that's exactly what Solomon is trying to tell the young man. When we think about the addresser, about the, the, the term Ecclesiastes from the Hebrew is the addresser of the assembly. So it is written sort of in, in the in a metaphorical way to where he is speaking to an assembly. But he is speaking to the young man. He is speaking to the young woman. He's speaking to the young married. He's speaking to the young parent. He is speaking in such a way that he is addressing the assembly. From the Hebrew, is often translated the preacher. From the Greek, it is often translated the teacher. Either one, it is telling us how to make different and better decisions within my life. The teacher, I believe, is more appropriate as it is in the Greek because he's teaching, he's upbuilding, he's strengthening, he's opening the eyes of those individuals who are simple and those who become blind. The purpose of how is how to live a life in the light of your father that's going to be acceptable. Solomon, remember, the Bible lets us, us know something. In 1 Kings chapter 3, 
God said to Solomon after David had died, and David was a great king. He unified the people. He built the city. He built, the, he built many of the structures. He gathered the material for the building of the temple. David was a great man, and after David had died, God came to Solomon and asked a question. I bet that all of us would love to have him ask, what do you want? What do you want me to give you? And when you talk about somebody that has all power, you know he can give it if you ask. You know what Solomon said, realizing he was following his storied father, his famous father. In 1 Kings chapter 3 and verses 9, Solomon said, Give thy servant an understanding heart that I may judge thy people. He says, help me, Father, to discern good and evil. What a wonderful request. God said you didn't ask for money. You didn't ask for the lives of your enemies. You didn't ask for all of these riches. He says, I'm going to give you all the stuff because what you asked me for was the essential of life, a discerning heart. What do you think Jesus means when he tells us, as he taught that wonderful sermon, when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and all the things will be given unto you. God is saying, when you trust me, when you walk in me, when you're not stupid, when you trust in me with all of your heart, with all of thine heart, and lean not on your own understanding, when you do that, God says, I will give you all the stuff that you might need. Solomon said that in the book of Proverbs, also a book of wisdom literature. In the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and verses 6, Solomon said, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Don't trust in your buddies. Don't trust in your homies. Don't trust in your colleagues. Don't trust in the politicians. Don't trust in the news commentators. Don't trust in the talk show hosts. He said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In essence, there are some things that I cannot grasp without the help of God to keep me from being stupid, to keep me from making a bad decisions. He said in verses 6, In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. How many folks don't, are in a crooked path in life? Crooked path in life because they haven't turned to God. I was coming to Memphis one time from Washington, and as I was flying over the Mississippi River for miles and miles and miles, it's a crooked body of water. It's called a meandering stream because water always seeks the path of least resistance. And when you see a crooked body of water, it's because over the centuries, it has taken the path of least resistance and eroded the landscape for miles and miles. How many folks have crooked lives today because they made bad decisions, because they didn't think, they didn't search the word of God, they didn't pray, they didn't follow God's will, God's word, and God's way. They took the path of least resistance. And when we look out there today, we will see so many people whose lives have been ruined because they didn't turn to God. In the book of Psalms 71 and verses 1, also wisdom literature, David wrote, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to, notice what he said, to confusion. That word confusion, according to the Apostle Paul, as he wrote, that God is not the author of confusion. That word confusion there in the Greek means instability. When you see unstable lives, bad decisions, it's because folks are not following the will, the word, and the way of God. So when we think about this, 
Solomon asked God for wisdom that he might discern between good and between evil. Why? Our wisdom is limited. God said one time, and he had Isaiah write, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts and ways are as far above your thoughts and ways as the heavens are above the earth. Ezekiel was told to tell the people in the book of Ezekiel chapter 44 and verses 43, this man of God was said, told, teach my people, Ezekiel was told, the difference between the holy and the profane. The only way I'm going to know the difference is that I turn to my Lord, to my God, and to my Father, and not to human wisdom. Hosea wrote one time in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, and verses 6. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. God basically says, I need y'all to be smart and make good decisions. When you go to book, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, when you look at verse 1, basically what the preacher says is remember now. Remember now thy creator. I heard, that, sir, I heard that scripture so many times when I was growing up. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. In essence, remember God in your best with your strength. Remember God when you have the most to offer. God would take us any time. Don't get me wrong. That's why in the parabolic teaching of Jesus, some went in early in the morning, some in the afternoon, some went in at almost quitting time. But every got, everybody got a penny. So the Lord's not saying that if you get your life right in the last part of your life, that he's not going to get you in heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you make your own life hard. How many young people do we know are just like the prodigal? The book of Ecclesiastes is constantly warning the young man not to do what the prodigal did. The prodigal left home. He's going to make his mark. Give me what belongs to me. He took his father's living and went out, the Bible says, to a far country. It wasn't about his father writing a check or handing him a cashier's check. His father had to give him a part of the sheep, of the goat, of the camels, of the servants, of, of, of the gold, of the silver, of the bronze. His father gave him a portion, so he left home with a caravan of his father's possessions. The Bible lets me know he made bad decisions. He was stupid, and he wasted it wasted it, trusting the wrong people, riotous living, and he found himself in a pig pen about to eat the maggot-filled husk that the pigs were eating. And the Bible, as Jesus is teaching, I believe what Jesus wants us to see in our imagination is this young man with this maggot-filled, stinky stuff that the pigs were going to eat and Jews didn't even eat pig that he got it close to his face, his mouth, and that ammonia hit him, and he jerked his head back, and he's looking and saying, what am I doing? What has happened to me? The Bible said he came to himself, and he says, I'm going home, back to my daddy's house. How many folks have left home to set the world on fire, had to come back home and get another match? Because the world is a hard place, unforgiving. And that's what Solomon is trying to tell the young man in the book of Ecclesiastes. You go to the last part of that chapter. He said, let us hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Why are you saying this, Solomon? He tells us why. For God shall bring every work into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. 
Solomon in wisdom literature is telling us to be wise, be smart. Don't give the devil the opportunity to laugh in the face of God, metaphorically holding his child in front of God's face and said, look what I did to this boy here. Look what I did to this little girl that you thought was so wonderful and virtuous. Look what I did to this home. Look what I did to this husband, to this wife. Look what I did to them. This is why when Paul is talking to our brethren and he's speaking to a young man that he had left at Crete, he had also left Timothy at Ephesus, and he said to him, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, doing what, Paul? Teaching us, in essence, telling us not to be stupid. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Talking to those young men, Paul spoke to them. Don't let nobody uh, 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 speak against your youth. Uh, don't get caught up in bodily exercise. He said those things profit very, very little. But he told them to stand the examples of the believers. What is God saying to all of us? What the Lord is saying to all of us is You've got to make good decisions because I am coming home one day. And you can't let men make you stupid because, you see, men will call sin accident. But God calls sin abomination. Men call sin a blunder. It's just a blunder. God calls sin blindness. Men call sin chance. Well, it just didn't work out right. God calls sin choice. Men call sin fascination. Well, you know, it, it was tempting. God calls sin fatality. The wages of sin is death. Men call sin infirmity. Everybody's sick. Everybody needs a therapist. Everybody uh, needs a psychologist and a psychiatrist and some type of drug to help them make it through life. Men call sin infirmity. God calls sin iniquity. It's iniquitous. You decided to do that. James said, don't lie on God. James said, don't you lie on God. He said, let no man say when he sins, I'm tempted of God. He said, no. God is not tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. James said, every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire, his own lust. In essence, what the devil wants to do, what sinners want to do to those who are God's people is to draw us away and make us think that good is evil and evil is good. Basically, as Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5, I believe, verse 20, woe to those that call evil good and good evil. And the world wants to tell you that sin has been homogenized and pasteurized and repackaged. Sin got a brand new marketing campaign, and it tells you how you can be happy with sin and live. Man calls sin luxury. If you can pay for it, you deserve it. God call it lawlessness. I've given you my law, and you decided not to follow it. Men will call sin trifle. Trivial. It's no big deal. Everybody does it. I remember one time my daughter who got married last September when she was about three or four years old. We, my wife and I went to pick her up and she got in the car and she smelled like the good earth itself. They had been playing outside all day and I turned around and said, Christy, what have you been doing, baby? She said, oh, that's okay, daddy. Everybody in my class stinks. <laughs> And how many of us in our lives, everybody's like this. Everybody's doing it. It's okay. It's the new morality. You've got to get on the right side of history. You've got to put this old Bronze Age book away. And you've got to listen to folks. So man calls sin trifle. God calls it tragedy. Men call sin distraction. 
God calls sin destruction. Here's the deal. In the last day, when our Lord comes to call us from labor to reward, what Solomon was trying to tell them, it's not what men call sin, it's what God calls sin that's going to judge us in the last day. The Lord wants us to understand, and he wants us to live in such a way that we bring glory to his name. David could kill a giant, but he couldn't raise a son. And his house, God said, the sword will never leave because of the progressiveness of sin. Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standeth in the way of the sinners, sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law doth he meditate day and night. When we hear what is right, and we believe it with all of our heart, there's a process that's happening within us because the word of God and faith will alter you on the inside. Folks want things to change on the outside before they change things on the inside. When we change the inside, life changes. And I can say, I believe Jesus is the son of God. The Lord told the woman who had been caught in, in sin in, in the very act, he said, you stop sinning. I don't accuse you, You're, though I have sent those away who did, but you stop sinning. The Lord is saying to every one of us, change, change, don't be stupid. Weigh it, look at the good, the bad. One day I'm coming back. And if you bury your old man and you stand up again, you've been reborn, recreated, every bad word as though you never said it, every bad deed as though you never did it, you have a new birth, a new life. That's a good deal, y'all. That's a good deal. And to have Jesus come back and say, you're going back with me. I'm taking you home. I'm going to give you a body that don't get old, don't get sick, don't have any problems. I'm taking you home with me. I've already got the house ready because you trusted me and you acted with wisdom and discerning and obedience. If you fall away, God don't need you to walk on broken glass. He don't need you to take a whip and beat yourself up. He don't need you to do any of that stuff. All he needs you to do is come home and acknowledge that you were wrong. The prodigal said, I have sinned against God, against heaven. That's all God wants because you're his children. Solomon wanted you to be wise. That's why the book was written. He was the laboratory of human experience. Everything that could be had, he had it done, he did it. And he said, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. There's nothing on this earth, he's saying, worth going to hell over. So make the right decisions. Think about it while we stand up. Church of
closing song this evening is number 937. What a terrific way to begin our summer series. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. We appreciate that good lesson that we studied together tonight. We appreciate you and your stand for the truth and preaching God's word. Thank you very much. I want to thank each of you for your attendance tonight. We have a good number present. We have several who are visiting. If you're visiting, I want you to know that you're always welcome, and we're glad that you're here and invite you to worship with us at every opportunity you may have. If you're present and not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper and to give your means, you can make yourself at this time to the front of the auditorium and through the door on my right. The brethren there to assist you as you continue your worship to God. I want to remember those who are sick in our daily prayers to visit them and help bring them cheer each day that we are able to do so. Remember Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., our midweek Bible study. We'll sing this song and then be led in our dismissal prayer. You are beautiful beyond description to Son, that he came to earth, he set forth the plan of salvation, that we now have the hope of eternal life with you. That such a beautiful place you prepared for us that is beyond our imagination. Father, pray that thou forgive us our sins, that we may obtain that goal to serve you throughout eternity. Father, we're thankful for the summer series that started this evening. We're thankful that we have Brother John DeBerry, come our way to teach us from thy word. We bid him thy speed, long as he continues to teach the truth from thy word. And Father, as he's taught us to not, help us to not be dumb, and turn our back on you as Satan will devour us. Father, help us to stay on that straight and narrow pathway. Be with us always. Forgive us our sins. This way in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.